Hello again, I'm going to talk to you today about something called JTAG, which stands for Joint Test Action Group. Well, you still don't know what it's all about, do you? So keep listening. So we're going to be talking about this from the context of development of embedded systems. And I'm going to contrast life before JTAG, which is when I started, and life after JTAG, and, uh, which is the situation right now. Then I'm going to go into a little bit more about what's inside JTAG, what does it do, um, and then see where we can use it beyond the obvious use that I'm going to tell you, which is, is debugging. We're going to see what other kinds of things that JTAG can enable. So the context is development of embedded systems. Now, the main thing to note is that an embedded system, whether it's something like this or it's something like these, it is not like a desktop PC or a laptop. It's very different. Um, with embedded systems, you're generally getting some hardware and software which must be developed and debugged and tested simultaneously. You don't have the benefit of a system which already works and you're just installing new software on it. You're often the first person to use a system. And the example I've shown on the screen here is one from my own past, on the right hand side is a newly made printed circuit board. It's a system that I developed. It's actually the parallel processing unit that I designed for Singapore's first satellite. It has 20 ARM processors on it. It's extremely complicated. And I designed it, sent it off to get manufactured. It came back and did it work? Well, I turned it on, nothing happened. Of course it didn't work. And if you just take a look at the little wires, the mod wires on there, you can see that um, part of the reason it didn't work was because there were some mistakes in the printed circuit board. This is very common for prototype devices. So to run this up, to find out why it doesn't work or whether it works, I needed to use JTAG. And the little board on the left, the little printed circuit board that's there, is something that I designed um, I ran a company which sold these, and they're JTAG test devices. And it's connected up to the main board with some wires, and in particular you can see the, the twisted orange, black, and white wires here. And these are the JTAG connections that are coming from just here onto the main board. And there's a, a ribbon cable, the grey flexible cable, coming from my JTAG device and that's connected to the back of a laptop in the days when laptops had parallel ports. So this is about development of embedded systems in particular. And we have to recognize that there's different phases in the development process. So the first phase is that you get some new hardware. You've designed some hardware, or maybe you've even bought it, or you've modified it. But this hardware is unknown. Uh, we don't know if it works, and in fact, it probably doesn't. So we call this running up new hardware, getting new hardware to the state where you know what's happening and you can make it work. Then you develop some software and you put the software on, the, on that, that hardware and that involves running up new software. At the beginning, we're often running up new hardware and new software together. But once the hardware is sorted out, then anytime we get new software, we're running up new software on old hardware, which is a lot easier. Embedded systems have a, a high level of integration between the hardware and the software. They're often controlling things in the real world using sensors and so on. And there's a, this interaction between hardware and software means we need to debug that interaction. We need to debug hardware, we need to debug software, but we need to debug the two of them together. And it makes life fun and difficult. And JTAG is the, the tool that we use most often in doing this low-level type debugging. And it does it really well, but it also does quite a lot more. And I think two of the primary uses are shown here. The first one is in flashing blank hardware. That's where you get a printed circuit board that contains the hardware, but it's got no software or firmware. Flashing means you put the firmware or the low-level software in there. And the other use for JTAG is in forensic use or reverse engineering. 
Uh, and this is actually, it's real fun. It's taking a, a board, a printed circuit board or a unit, and you don't know what's inside there. And then using JTAG to try to work out what's in there. And from that, you can identify what the hardware is. You can identify how it's connected and you can even pull out software. All very good for the hardware hacker, reverse engineer. So to look at more about the, the JTAG topic and more about um, how JTAG works, why it's useful and the contrast between before JTAG and after JTAG, let's just refresh ourselves on how a microprocessor system in a typical embedded device works. So I've got a diagram on the screen here. And on the left hand side, I've got some flash memory that contains program storage and a bit of boot code in an ARM process of the boot code might be in the bottom of flash memory. That's connected using a, a bus, usually a parallel bus into a microcontroller. There might be some other external peripherals connected to that bus. And then inside the microcontroller, there's internal peripherals or units that all hang off that bus. The two main units are internal memory, RAM, and the CPU itself. The CPU being the central processing unit rather than the entire device. Now, when we see that structure, we just want to stop for a moment and think about how do we boot this device. You boot the device, the CPU contains no program. No code, no instructions, it's nothing. But when you turn on the CPU, when you turn on the microcontroller, the CPU looks at the reset vector in the interrupt vector table, and it looks at the reset vector or the start point of the interrupt vector table to see the instruction as to what it should do. Okay, now that in many systems is jump to boot code and boot code might be in flash memory starting at address zero. In other systems, when you turn on the CPU, the boot code from flash is automatically copied into RAM, and then the CPU reads the boot code from RAM. But whatever happens, there needs to be some way for the boot code that's in the external flash to get into the microcontroller whether it's through um, the CPU executing code directly from flash, or whether it's through this automatic process where the flash information is copied into internal RAM. It doesn't really matter. The boot code is external, the program code is external, and it needs to be put inside the microcontroller. Now in normal usage, normal usage is that the, the CPU has turned on, the microcontroller is booted up and it's running some code and it needs to run some more code. Generally what happens is the code, the programs that aren't running are stored in flash memory. So on your computer it might be your programs are stored on hard disk. And when you double click an icon on the desktop and it runs a program, the program code is taken from a hard disk and put into RAM and then it's executed, it's run from RAM. In an embedded system, you don't have a hard disk usually, you have flash memory. So again, there's this process of taking something from flash, bringing it into the microcontroller and then executing it internally. That internal code, as it runs, it's probably talking to the peripherals. It's talking over this bus to the external or internal peripherals and units. And it's going to be doing many things inside the microcontroller. Sometimes the internal code will access the flash memory as well. So all this means that flash memory is important, but how do we get the code into flash memory in the first place? Well, if you have uh, an embedded system that's, let's say it's something that's very cheap, um, inexpensive embedded system, usually it won't have flash memory. It will have some mask program device. That means that the, um, the flash memory is replaced by a cheaper block of memory that is fixed. You cannot reprogram it. But if you have an embedded system that's more expensive like this, the, the boot code and the program code can be rewritten. It's in flash memory. And how it gets rewritten? Well, the CPU can rewrite it, but the CPU can't 
write flash memory at the beginning because the CPU has got nothing in it. The CPU has got no code. So the first thing that writes to flash memory is usually JTAG. Okay, to be, to be fair, you can take the flash memory devices and you can pop them into a programmer and you can program them and then you can solder them to the printed circuit board. So this is what happens sometimes. Or you just take the empty flash memory devices, solder them to the printed circuit board, plug in JTAG and you flash code into that device. The last point I want to think about here is how would you analyze the system? How would you hack this system? So if this is a system which is given to you and it's running and you want to know what's happening, well, the way you would hack it, right? I mean, the obvious way you'd hack this is that you'd look at what's happening on the data bus, address bus, and control bus, right? As the system is running, the CPU, internal RAM, the peripherals, external peripherals, the flash memory, they're all connected to the bus. So if you can look at the bus and you can see what's happening on the bus, that's your way into the system. That's your way to understand the system. So that's the background about you know, how we can look at a microprocessor system. Now with that context in mind, I'm gonna tell you about life before JTAG. I used to work for the British government. I worked in a communications research center and I made a lot of hardware. And I would get the hardware, which contained microprocessors, digital signal processing chips, RAM, peripherals, and so on, some piece of hardware. And I'd get it back from the factory, an empty piece of hardware. And I would get it back, and my job would be, this hardware I've designed, um, does it work? Well, it would often have some flash memory. So I had a flash programmer. I'd put my... In fact, it was probably... Um, pre-flash, it was probably an EEPROM, electric, electronically erasable um, programmable read-only memory or some variant of that. And I'd put it in a programmer, I'd put this device in a programmer and I'd plug it into a socket on my printed circuit board. That device would now be programmed with some code. And the first piece of code that I would usually write for a new bit of hardware is something that will turn the LED on and off. It will toggle the LED on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. So I'd get this blank piece of hardware. I'd write a small piece of code that just toggled the LED. I'd program that code into the memory device. I'd plug the memory device onto my printed circuit board. I'd apply power, and I would pray that this thing worked. I'd turn the power on, and usually it didn't. Usually the LED would just stay there, and it would be off. And I think... Okay, right, the LED's off, what's wrong? I'd look at my code, I'd double check it, that the code is correct, and I'd have to start examining the hardware. And I would often wire up a logic analyzer to the data bus, address bus, and control bus. This is a, a very expensive piece of test kit that would analyze the bus, and it would tell you what's happening on the, the bus lines. And I would look at that, and I would turn the power on and look at the logic analyzer and see, is the bus toggling as it should? If the bus isn't toggling as it should, maybe there's a problem with the microcontroller. Maybe I, I've got a problem with the reset pin or the power pins or the clock or something, and I would debug those. If the data address and control bus are toggling in a way that looks like they should be, then maybe there's a problem with my code, or maybe there's a problem with the LED, which is wired up. And I go through a whole sequence of diagnostic checks. And the typical time for a small printed circuit board to get it run up, to get it so that I can reliably toggle the LED, could be anything from a couple of days to a couple of weeks, sometimes even three weeks or a month. Some people I, I knew never got their printed circuit boards working. This is really difficult. And the logic analyzer, uh, that might cost about $80,000. So you can see this was an expensive, time-consuming, really difficult thing that I spent weeks and months of my life doing. And then came JTAG. And it was a revolution. 
It was completely different. What you would do is you'd make sure you had a JTAG port on your printed circuit board in your hardware design and that wired directly to the CPU. Then you'd get the printed circuit board back from the factory, you'd pop it down, plug JTAG into it, plug the JTAG into your computer, turn on the power, and the JTAG would tell you exactly what's happening inside that CPU. The CPU is not working, JTAG will tell you. It's still in reset, JTAG would tell you. The CPU is trying to get code from boot, from uh, boot code from flash, JTAG would tell you. The CPU manages to get the boot code, JTAG can let you look at that code. And it was like a window inside the hardware. For the first time, instead of using all this stuff plugged in on the outside, I could actually look at what was happening inside. It was absolutely revolutionary. When you got code inside the CPU, JTAG would allow you to put new code in there, overwrite it, step, step through the code, put control points. It would allow you to test the peripherals, control the peripherals, and debug anything in hardware or software that was connected to that CPU. Once the system was working, once you'd used JTAG to debug that system and you were happy with it, then JTAG could even flash the code into your flash memory. It could even program boot code into your flash memory for you. And it would do that by controlling the CPU to write to flash memory. So what is this thing called JTAG, Joint Test Action Group? Well, it's a standard IEEE 1149, the IEEE organization in America. And they had people that were working in IC design. And these people knew that there was a need for better test equipment. So they defined this standard, which is actually a boundary scan path controller. We'll see this in a moment. And it became so good and so popular that it's used in pretty much every CPU you'll ever use. All ARM Cortex devices that I know about incorporate JTAG. Now, to be fair, the IEEE committee originally designed this to test for CPU manufacturing faults. So when you get a printed circuit board, you could plug in JTAG and use that to diagnose the board to find out if there's a manufacturing fault. But once this standard had been designed and people saw what it could do, it rapidly became the number one indispensable tool for creating new hardware, and especially for embedded systems. So it is a vital skill to know. It is a vital piece of technology. So what's a boundary scan path controller or boundary scan tester? Uh, and this is a piece of hardware that can read input going into something and output coming out of something. So in the diagram I've shown here, I've got a, a thing which is called unit under test right in the middle. Now that could be an internal piece of silicon and an IC, or it could be a separate IC on a printed circuit board. And the boundary scan path controller is monitoring the outputs and the inputs to that unit under test. So the unit under test is itself a black box. We can use the boundary scan controller to see what's going in and to see what's coming out. And thereby we can try to work out whether the unit under test is really working. Furthermore, the boundary scan doesn't just allow you to read what's going in and what's coming out. It can also set the data, it can write data into the device under test. And it can even take the data which is coming out of the unit under test and overwrite it with different outputs. So just to recap, it's got a unit under test. The boundary scan path controller can look at everything going into the unit under test and it can control what's going into it. The same boundary scan controller can look at what's coming out of the unit under test, and it can even overwrite what's coming out of the unit under test. And it can do this for several units under test, shown on this page. 
On this page, we've got an internal unit, an external driver, and a serial port driver. And each of those has a boundary scan path control port connected to it. It's just an example. And it shows a little bit more about how the boundary scan controller works. It's a serial bus. It goes around in one direction. OK, you can see that with the arrows. And that bus contains data, and it contains control signals and a clock. And each of those scan path units at the input and output to the unit under test, this is actually a multiplexer. So we can see that the, the serial information going into an internal unit is going through this boundary scan path um, serial parallel multiplexer. It will come out into the internal unit or will go out on the scan path in a serial fashion. Okay, so the scan path is always serial, but the, um, the information going into the internal unit might be in parallel. In fact, it's usually in parallel. Uh, the only other thing to note is the test I.O. port which is the thing that connects to the JTAG controller. This is actually from an ARM processor. It's from the ARM system architecture book by Stephen Ferber, but I've expanded it to show a lot of internal detail. It shows the five pins of the JTAG, or the basic JTAG interface. Test data input, test data output, test clock, test mode select, and test reset. It's an N there to show, a little N, to show this is an active low signal. The actual JTAG um, hardware is along the bottom of this diagram, and it's the scan path. So it's everything that's in the light red color is the actual JTAG stuff. Uh, and the dark gray serial parallel multiplexes. We can see, if you carefully trace through everything, that the, the TDI pin, the test data in, um, that pin is traveling through the entire device, and it's going around the CPU, the first internal block, and the second internal block. It's wiring up all of their inputs and all of their outputs. It can read everything going into those units. It can read everything coming out of those units. Furthermore, it can write data into those units, and it can overwrite data coming out of those units. Think about that just for a second. What that means is that the JTAG is not just useful for looking at the stuff inside, the CPU, the internal block, and the internal block above it. The JTAG can also read the input to the microcontroller, and it can also read and write the output from the microcontroller. And we see a couple of I.O. pins there, which JTAG can also deal with. So it doesn't just test what's inside, it can be used to test and control what's outside. Very, very useful. So we've got a basic hardware system where there's a, a host development system, it's your laptop or whatever, and that's connected to a target. The target is an embedded board that you want to debug or run up or use. And it's connected via JTAG. And the JTAG port connects to a JTAG control unit. And the JTAG control unit usually connects via USB. The picture I showed earlier showed, uh, connected JTAG via a parallel port. This is uh, older technology. We don't get parallel ports on computers these days, so we use USB. And the JTAG controller allows the host system, the software on the host system, to download data, uh, download code or anything to the target board, download a program, and run it on the target board. It's a single step, add watch points, break points, to view the internal registers, to view memory, to erase anything on that board, like flash memory or internal RAM to reprogram it, to test onboard flash memory, 
how you test it, you wipe it and you check it's all erased and you program it and check it's programmed correctly. Then you wipe it and check it's all erased again. Like I've said, the JTAG could control the onboard peripherals directly from the host. You can actually write a small program on the host to control the peripheral on the embedded board. It's, it's great fun to do that. It can read everything going into the microcontroller and it can overwrite almost everything coming out. There's a couple of things it can't control. It can't control typically reset pins or clock pins and some of the low level power handling. But all the logic stuff it's able to handle. Now it was, uh, JTAG was designed originally for manufacturing fault checking and it can still do that. Uh, if you get some boards back, some printed circuit boards back from the factory and you run them up, let's say you've got five boards and one of them doesn't work. Well, you want to find out why that one doesn't work. It might be that when they soldered down the microcontroller, they missed one of the pins or they put too much solder on there and some of the pins shorted together. You can find this out with JTAG. I mentioned hacking. Um, I'd love to reverse engineer systems. I'm not supposed to call it hacking because hacking sounds illegal. But as long as the system has got JTAG pins, you can find out almost everything going on in there. And this is also useful for forensics. So imagine that if I'm an international criminal, I'm not by the way, but imagine I'm an international criminal and you wanted to find out all of the illegal contacts I've got on my phone. Well, I'm clever. I probably set my phone up that if you turn my phone on without the right fingerprint or passcode, it automatically erases everything. Well, my phone's an ARM-based iPhone. It's got an ARM processor in there. It's got JTAG inside. I can whip the back off the phone. I can plug JTAG into the chip in here. I can hold the CPU in reset and then control everything from JTAG. The CPU never gets to run and therefore the code never gets to operate. So if you want to find out everything inside a computer, even if somebody clever has set it up so it auto deletes, then you use JTAG. You can see how useful this is. If you happen to be um, somebody that's um, very paranoid about security, you should also realize that JTAG could be used for man in the middle attacks or monitoring. I mean, JTAG can check everything coming into a computer and everything going out of it. It can also modify that. This includes when your computer is set up to do online banking. JTAG could potentially be used to monitor and change that. So with every very powerful tool, there's also some safety concerns. So with that, we've talked about development embedded of embedded systems. I, I talked about what it really means um, to develop embedded systems. I gave you a bit of background, showed you um, some of the internals, what happens when you boot a system and when it runs. I gave you a little perspective about life before JTAG and life after JTAG. Um, and I said very clearly, life after JTAG is way better than life before. I talked about what JTAG is, what it can do, and how you can use it beyond just debugging. As you probably guess, I love JTAG. It revolutionized my job when I worked in industry. And I think that it's, uh, it's a really good technology to become familiar with. Um, I'll just end by saying you can download code that controls JTAG and you can hack it. There's a code, for example, for a Raspberry Pi that can uh, do JTAG on the Raspberry Pi output pins. You can play with it. You can do it yourself. Or you can buy $10,000 worth of test equipment and software that you run on your computer that you control another system with. It will be less flexible, but it's a lot easier to use. And JTAG is flexible enough that you can do it yourself. You can learn everything about it yourself, or you can just use it. And you probably will. Thank you.